thanks very much, uh, Rachel. Thanks to all of you for coming. I'm, I know enough economics to know that there's probably a very strong <laughs> selection effect amongst those in the audience. If you think the idea of interdisciplinarity is completely ridiculous, you're probably not here. Um, <laughs> so if you're halfway home already just by revealed preference, um, I'm hopefully going to give you something to uh, use when perhaps you find yourself engaging in these kinds of uh, discussions with your colleagues. Um, as Rachel mentioned, I've uh, worked in the research department of the World Bank since 1998. I'm the first and only non-economist, not just sociologist, the first and only non-economist out of 100 people ever hired in the research department. That means literally every research grant I write, every working paper I put together, every bid for promotion, every single word of it has to be vetoed by people that don't have the training I do. <laughs> Um, on the scale of human difficulty, on a one to scan, to, on a ten sort of scale, it's probably about a minus fifty in terms of what serious problems in the world actually need. <laughs> Nonetheless, it is an existential kind of question when you are engaged in doing this kind of work and know that, geez, yet again, I've got to try and figure out how to say this in nice little language and then deal with the, uh, oh, you can't use jargon when it's totally fine to use opportunity cost or whatever blah, 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 as part of your language when you're living in someone else's world. <clears throat> But that's kind of what I feel like. Actually, sort of on a on a weird day, I usually say I'm sort of a, I'm a Hindu working at the Vatican. I'm sort of this. Uh, <laughs> I, I have a very I like to think very sort of, uh, internally coherent, but to the outside looks like it's all over the place kind of view of how the world works. And yet I'm surrounded and ruled by people who have a very popish kind of view about what counts as a question and what counts as an answer. Right. Um, and sort of what lesson one of sociology, I would have thought, right, at least I have thought from the beginning, was that we all reside in this uh, wonderful jargonish term called <laughs> epistemic communities. We all, the whole structuring of academic life around this concept of disciplines is that we are members of particular sects within particular religions, and those religions have to kind of get on with each other. And so the argument for multidisciplinarity was not sort of we should split the difference between Hinduism and Catholicism and sort of make up a new thing. It's like, how do we get these guys to take each other seriously? How do we, how do we be respectful? How do we understand them in their own terms and yet figure out that on a good day, <laughs> bringing those two groups into conversation with each other can actually yield all sorts of insights that just tripling down on your own little field and nudging the crystal a little degree so that you can get a few extra stars in your regression model just doesn't do it. And I, so from the, I know maybe it's how I'm hardwired in my brain, but I just never got excited about having ever refiner estimates that X causes Y controlling for a bunch of Zs. Mm -hmm. I just said, no, I'm much more bigger picture. I'm much more wanting to actually solve real problems in the world and see social science as contributing to the resolution of those problems. And problems, again, from undergraduate level methodology, problems should determine the kinds of methods and, and that you use, not the other way around. And yet so much of elite academia, at least, I think completely reverses that. It starts with method and then spends years of its life trying to acquire ever refiner knowledge of that particular technique and then chooses the questions that that particular technique happens to be able to answer. Um, anyway, so my life has been spent trying to uh, apply my trade in a, in a foreign land. <laughs> and uh, that's been uh, an exciting adventure, uh, largely because, as I said, I've tried to uh, see that this is something that is, is motivated by solving problems. I'm not trying to convert people to my religion. I'm trying to show that, that we can together uh, make a difference. And at least in the World Bank, the metric of your, of your success is are you telling me something I don't know? Are you helping me to make this project work a little better than it would be otherwise? And I think when, we, when you have that as the, as the foundation on which you uh, go forward and the, and the basis on which you work, then uh, you can find all sorts of opportunities for uh, bringing different perspectives to bear. So one of those particular fields that I've uh, that four years ago published a book on with um, a World Bank colleague in the research department and with others was on history. Um, Ten years ago, I was part of uh, a World Development Report team on inequality. And you know, pretty uh, much was part of that conversation, we reached the conclusion that was already been reached before, not just in context matters, but history matters. So where institutions come from uh, must, in some sense, be grounded in history. But as it turned out, at that particular time, 
uh, two very uh, wonderful human beings, very influential uh, economists, Jim Robinson and Darren Uchimoglu. Uh, we're doing, we're making huge waves as, uh, as as young scholars at the time, trying to show that history mattered because they had this wonderful instrument for settler mortality back in the 18th century, that they now could use Eureka-like to publish articles in the QJE showing that history mattered, and uh, it was just surreal to me <laughs> that we are now we're in a world where we could, where the epistemic community was now in the headspace where they could think about something called history because. We had some uh, instrument back from the 18th century that now could prove that history mattered. And I just said, well, maybe if we concede that history matters, maybe historians matter, right? <laughs> if we went to a conference where the big conclusion was economics matters, but we didn't have to consult economists, we would all think that was kind of weird, right? So I said, well, maybe if we reached a conclusion that history matters, we should actually consult one of the most ancient and venerable disciplines that existed way before economics even came to think of itself as a, as a discipline. Maybe we should consult those guys and maybe they can teach us something about how the world and these things called institutions came to be what they are. Right? Not long after that, I found myself in this very high level meeting at the World Bank. With the, uh, and it was a big meeting on um, the Middle East and, uh, and what we could, what we, the research department, could sort of contribute to the broader knowledge of what was being done. And I won't name this particular colleague, but they stood up in, in front of a group of Middle Eastern people, Middle Eastern professionals, people who have spent their whole life working on this particular issue and say, well, you know, we've got this great data from the, from the, from the Western Europe that, and this uh, settler mortality data that really helps us to be able to understand how institutions came to work in, in Europe. But in the Middle East, we're kind of, we just, it's a big black box. We don't have any knowledge really about the way that institutions work in the Middle East. I'm just going, <laughs> there are freaking forests that have been felled about around understanding the history of the Middle East and why the Middle East is the way it is. How do we construct a universe in which everything is a black box that doesn't happen to fit into the particular epistemic community's rules about what counts as a question and what counts as an answer? Right? So the whole virtue, it seemed to me, of, of a no, very non-radical kind of thing, was saying, well, if we take history seriously, we should take historians seriously. If we take historians seriously, then there's this whole vast treasure trove of knowledge out there that you've just completely ruled out of existence because you choose to rule it out of existence because your own little club, your own little sect within that club, within that religion, deems it so. Right? And so I think one of the most basic things we should be doing is just having a much richer intellectual history about how we've constructed the tone in terms of scholarly debate within social sciences in general, um, and how we kind of come to uh, frame and set up uh, monopolies essentially around what counts as a question and what counts as an answer. In my world, in my view, <laughs> I'm all for free trade. I'm all for, I think monopolies are bad. What happens with monopolies? Econ 101, they create inefficiencies because they don't allow for the low, high barriers to entry. They don't let people trade when they should be trading. And I think we should be much more in a world where we allow ideas to trade, where we allow evidence to trade, and then we do what a market does. <laughs> it determines who wins just in some sense because of, uh, a broader structure that then allows that to happen. One of the consequences of that though, I think, is that we have to tolerate on a higher standard deviation in the, in, the, in the work that we do. And I think that's one of the frustrations perhaps of having a life spent doing interdisciplinary, at, at the intersection of, of interdisciplinary work. And I will concede, <laughs> even within my own field of sociology, there is just, a, I think, a much higher standard deviation of work. That there is, I will freely concede, a whole bunch of stuff that really is qualitative blah blah, that it is kind of dumb. And it just really, it isn't kind of, ugh, it just makes me just, well, how did that stuff ever get out the door, right? But you've got to tolerate some of that, it seems to me, as the price you pay for getting the genius at the other end. So let's actually treat this momentarily as an empirical phenomena and go to our wonderful favorite Google tool, Scholar Google, <laughs> and look at how, what the data says about the distribution of publications. Right? As it happens, the journal Nature did a wonderful article 11 months ago on the top 100 citations of all time in any field. Right? So this is physics, biochemistry, biology, you name it. Here we have just a rank ordering from, from one down to 100 of the top all-time scholarly contributions as measured by uh, citations uh, by others in the field. 
And the top citation now is an article from 1956 in physics with over a quarter of a million citations. The median, by the way, is one <laughs> for all citations ever. But there's a really crazy distribution. But how many articles or books by economists do you think there are in that top 100? Guesses? <laughs> there are seven. Two of them are by Michael Porter, right? So probably some of us with a slight arrogance in our things, like, yeah, that's not really economics, right? Um, so maybe <laughs> competitive advantage of nations, is that economics? No. So Green's econometrics textbook is, the, is, is number two on the list. There's uh, William, Oliver Williamson, Doug North, and a, and, a, and a handful of others on the theory of the firm. If you generously include Michael Porter, there's seven, right? Uh, well before you get to any of, and, and Adam Smith, sorry, is on that list as well. Right? So there's your seven, right? There are 19 by non-economists. Number six on the list, all time, most cited, any field ever, Robert Lin's book on case studies. Right? Over 100,000 citations, right? How many economists, how, <laughs> how many are in the room? I didn't know that before, but I was going, wow. It's amazing, right? That whole particular methodology approach to doing things is way more cited than anything ever written on econometrics. You would not know that if you didn't know that there was this other whole field out there. All this, there's like four of the major qualitative textbooks are on this top 100 ever cited. Michael Foucault's work has been cited over half a million times. <laughs> as uh, H scores way higher than Amartya and, and, uh, and Joe Stiglitz. <laughs> that whole field is out there. Right? But it's really, I think it's a really high standard deviation. It means that there are geniuses out there, but there's a bunch of dunces as well. And in my world, <laughs> I'm quite happy to tolerate a pretty high standard deviation in quality because I think that's, that we, at least at the cutting edge of, of thinking and doing, you've got to tolerate a lot of crap to be able to get the really good stuff happening. And that to me is what the essence of doing good dialogical work in the interdisciplinary space is all about. So I mentioned the stuff that we did, we did in history, which, and the whole purpose of this exercise was to try and take history seriously. How did we actually get ministries of education and health uh, to actually form when they did? Where did social protection come from? Where did the idea that we should protect and support women and, uh, uh, and, and pensioners will come from? Where did that, that was an idea before it was a policy. Where, who thought that up? Who campaigned for it? Who made it actually happen? Right? Those are the really powerful contributions that social historians can make to how we think about a whole bunch of different things in development policy today. Another particular realm that I've worked in, um, other than with economists, who are my most cited co-authors, but I've done a lot of work most recently over the last 10 years or so with lawyers. Um, the field of law and economics is another crazy bizarre field, it seems to me, that within the Vatican looks entirely normal and outside just looks surreal. Right? So one of the most cited fields in, in the law and economic stuff is applies to institutions, is the stuff by Laporta, La, La, Raphael Laporta et al. and QJE, where the entire econometric model is what we code the, the difference between common law and civil law one zero, toss it into a regression stew, and now we conclude thus that common law countries do better than civil law countries. And there'd be all sorts of no, not, solemn nodding heads inside a, an econometric seminar about, mm, yeah, I don't know. Like, that, just, that is just the lunacy level of that kind of way of thinking about what the law is, how it comes to be the law, and what the policy implications are of that kind of stuff is just nuts, right? But it's not nuts within the epistemic community that gets to define what the question is and what the answer is. It makes entire sense and very solemn people can, can nod their way. Now, that's not to say that there is, a, there is something else out there <laughs> uh, necessarily that's inherently better. It's to say that for those kinds of questions, for those kinds of challenges, it's only the interdisciplinary dialogue that's gonna spark the craziness that will produce maybe the insight that actually moves the thing forward. We're not in the world of physics. We are social scientists, whether you're an economist or an anthropologist, whereas doing social science, the knowledge claims we make are inherently very qualified. And so that's what's made, to conclude, that's what's made this, you know, the latest big debate over the summer in development economics, as you may know, has been around the so-called warm wars, right? All these, all these, should we replicate and should we have free open access to each other's data and should we be requiring that everybody, right? Uh, that, that whole kerfuffle, it seems to me, is just a product of, uh, a very strange sort of way of thinking about what rigor means and what generalizability and external validity uh, claims you are entitled to having done particular kinds of modes of analytical reasoning. 
it should be no surprise at all that we get different people using similar data and getting different kinds of results, or at least different sort of on the margins. That's all normal science. Number seven on the list of all time publications, Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions is all about saying, look, these knowledge communities are very powerful in terms of how they, how they shape how we think and how we act. And that's, I think, the most important lesson of what an interdisciplinary sensibility should teach us is that we are inherently, we are trained deeply socialized into a particular epistemic community by getting a PhD. That's the, other than the technical skills, it's mostly socialization. It's teaching you how to function in this particular space. The best article on that, by the way, is, an anth is a, by an economist putting on the hat of an anthropologist talking about his own field. Life Among the Econ, Western Economic Journal, 1973, the best article you've probably never read. <laughs> Look it up, right? By a Swedish guy whose name I'm not gonna butch I'll butcher if I try and pronounce, but <laughs> it's at UCLA. Uh, Life Among the Econ, it's called. Life Among the Econ, brilliant, satirical, as relevant now as it was when it was written back in 1973 about how, the tribe called the econ socializes their young, how they create a caste structure with the math econ at the top and the developments at the bottom. It's just beautiful, tongue in cheek. He totally gets the interdisciplinary thing. <laughs> He's trying to say, this is how my profession works. And without a self-consciousness that that's how your profession works, then you have no reason you can entirely dismiss the Hindus out there in the rest of the world. And I'm all for religious pluralism. <laughs> I'm all for linguistic pluralism. Uh, not just mashing them all together and getting a lowest common denominator, not denominator, because the big, big problems we now face can only be happened by bringing all of these in together into a UN type space where we respect each other's differences. We tolerate a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of crap, but we know that the nuggets of truth, that's the only way we're going to get the nugget of truth is if we tolerate that. Thanks very much. Thank you.